Hey Vince, Rick Seaman here. I'm in Costa Mesa, California at the Center Club, where inside there is a reunion going on. It's the 50 year reunion of the Air Force Academy's 1963 graduating class. One of those graduates is retired Major General John L. Borling, who has recently written a book called Taps on the Walls. He was shot down over North Vietnam in 1966, and he was held prisoner for almost seven years. And we're gonna to talk to John here in a moment. Let's go inside. General Borling, sir, thank you for joining us on the Veterans TV Network. And as our custom, I'd like to thank you for your service and say welcome home. I'd say the same to you. Thanks for thank your you service much. and welcome home. We're a couple of old soldiers here. I had my hair done specially for this interview. I want Good to job. Know. Good. Yeah, great. great. I, I love it. Hey, so, sir, I have two lists here. I'd like to read them off if you sure. don't mind. Uh, in your 37-year military career, you have flown the following aircraft. The F-15. F-15. Loved it. The F-16. Yeah, did that. The F-4. Phantom. Of course. The SR-71 Blackbird. You know, I, I flew that one time as the director of operations for SAC because we were contemplating. The Air Force had made the decision to do away with it, and I was convinced that we needed to save it. Uh, so I was battling everybody and went to do it to have the operational experience and also just the thrill of going, you know, north of... 70,000 and north yeah. of Mach 3, yeah. but it was a problem because you had to fly a simulator before you flew the airplane, and the simulator was already taken down. Uh, so I had to bring me the regulation, and I said, someone's got to own this regulation, and they said, well, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations for Strategic Air Command owns this regulation. I said, well, hell, that's me. I can wave me. So I did. <laughs> and uh, went flying the airplane, and God, right. uh, I still think that airplane should be flying. Yeah, I still yeah. think it's a It had yeah. such great capability. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. What else? Oh uh, well, we got Some the, other stuff. The U two. Yeah, I flew the TR one. The U two. Yeah. yeah. And uh, also B fifty two. B fifty two, B ones, all the stuff that SAC bombers. had. So yeah. from fighters into the SAC domain, and was very pleased to uh, make that transition late in life. Still think uh, in tended to pick on the fact that the Strategic Air Command went away. It was a bad national decision. They've tried to reassert it now in some form, yeah. but Strategic Air Command in Omaha was always kind of the foundation block, I thought, of the United States Air Force. Right. I'll tell you, the fighter business was, I think, in, in many cases, quote, more fun, uh, but the responsibility resting upon the SAC crews, especially the tanker crews, uh, and Colonel LeMay told me this, when I got to be the DO, he stuck his finger in my chest and said, remember Borling, he said, the mission of SAC is tankers, because that's how you project force. And at one time, I owned all of them, 535 tankers. Wow. And now we're down into the mid-300s, and I worry about our tanker force. I worry about our force structure, our air, our air power, right. because uh, no soldier's been killed by enemy air since World War II. It's because we've exercised uh, an air supremacy, a superiority. And I worry that we're letting that get away from us. And, and, and air power in and of itself uh, can win wars. So, okay, real quick here, uh, my second list, your decorations. Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, V for Valor, two Purple Hearts, Prisoner of War Medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, Superior Service Medal, Air Force Distinguished Service Medal, and the Defense Distinguished Service Medal. Forgive me if I missed anything. Well, there's, uh, Napoleon said it right when, when he said, you know, uh, we don't have to pay him anything if we give him brightly colored pieces of ribbon from there time to time. Uh, but in truth, I'm, I'm proud of the decorations uh, and the combat decorations especially. Uh, in, uh, I'll go back to the book. We, we, have, we have pictures in the book of, uh, in black and white, and then we list them in the back and, yeah. uh, because, you know, that's kind of how you, you keep score in the military a little bit, yeah, yeah. you know, what flagpoles you've been around. Sure, sure. And, uh, but if truth be known, it's the combat stuff that, uh, that, that ties guys together. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, 
you attended the Air Force Academy. That's part of the 37 That's, years, four years there. Right, and, and this, 30, and this reunion years. here is about the 50 Well, the, the 50th years. reunion for the Academy. We for were the, the first full right. class, the class of 63, the first mm -hmm. class to spend four years at the site. First class to have a chief of staff, Ron Fogelman. First class to graduate from the stadium. First class to do so many. First class to have a president right, speak at right. graduation. And John Kennedy, JFK, uh, is an honorary member of our class by wow. his acceptance. Wow. And we've got each man of our, each person of our class has a right. class cup. And much like the Doolittle Raiders, when the guys die, we toast them and turn the cup. And JFK's cup is in our case. We started with about 800 folks at the academy we graduated 499 so we had pretty recent decent uh, attrition yeah, yeah and then that so we had this case with 499 cups in it and we had that one spot down there and that's the JFK cup. wow yeah. that's really something so you well, what year were you commissioned then 1963 63 yeah. okay and then seems when, like yesterday yeah <laughs> tell me about it <laughs> when, when did you arrive in Southeast Asia, what were your right. early assignments? What what what, what started well, you they, off? Well, they were cranked up uh, at Laredo for pilot training, and in Texas, and then went out to Davis Montham in the F four, mm -hmm. and F four is two seat fighter, and it was brand new. And then went to George in Victorville, California. George is closed. Laredo is closed, uh, and joined the Eighth Wing in the four thirty third Squadron, Satan's Angels. And uh, stayed there through December '65. I'm proud to say I was the first lieutenant to upgrade in the front seat of the F-4, oh. and so flew swing seats okay. uh, in the course from then on. Right. And we went to war in December of '65. Left a three-month-old baby and my wife uh, on the south side of Chicago. And when I walked back in the door, that little girl was seven and a half. Oh my. Yeah. So flew a bunch of missions, and we flew north, uh, Laos and north, and. Uh, uh, I remember day one, uh, we went up on the first mission, there was no warm-ups, and we were pack six, we were in deep, lost a jet that day, Bob, Jeffrey, George Mims, uh, George didn't make it, we, did, we didn't think Bob made it either. Uh, one of my surprises when I got shot down was to learn that Bob Mims was alive by these tap codes we had on the wall. Yeah. Uh, the next day we lost another airplane, uh, got, got the crew back, wow. and, and so we were standing around the bar, and it's like, it's going to be a very long or a very short war, but anyway, the months rolled by. Right, so, and, uh, so your missions were, were... Bombing missions, principally. You flew out at uh, Thailand, right? Flew out at Thailand, you, Yuban, Yuban, Thailand. Yuban, right. right. That was a secret war. You know. <coughs> right, so you, uh, nothing in South Vietnam. Never never flew a mission in South Vietnam. Right. Uh, we were always up hitting infrastructure and right. military targets in the North. Yeah. Have you ever, in, in, in later years, did you, have you ever had a conversation with a, with a ground soldier and compared notes and had him tell you, like I would tell you, how much we loved when you guys showed up? Well, I, again, it goes back yeah. to the comments about air power. If you got, you've got air overhead, not just in and out, but right. air overhead, man, you keep the enemy's head down, you know, yeah. you inhibit yeah. stuff. So I like long loiter stuff. That's why the drones, crummy mission in my view, but that's why the drones tend to be effective. But I think we need long loitering airplanes. I went out on my first R&R &R to uh, Da Nang mm -hmm. and went out with the Marines uh, to get a taste of ground combat. And I got a taste of ground combat. Wow. Wow. After that, I went on to Bangkok. The heck with that stuff. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Talk well, at least, at least you went to the bars in Bangkok with some good stories. Well, right? yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah. Churchill said <laughs> that, you know, nothing in life is so exhilarating as to be shot at without result. Now, I guess he wasn't much of a ladies' guy, but, you know, I had a certain exhilaration <laughs> factor. But anyway, the, the reality is that uh, uh, war is terribly riveting. And you never really leave combat. We joke about it a lot because that's how you... That's how we cope. That's how you cope. That's yeah. how you deal with it. Yeah. But in, in the end, you think differently about the enemy as time goes by. And I've been back to Vietnam. And I've, in fact, had an interview with Bo Ninh Cha. Wow. Uh, and it's in this book again. Uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't stop, I guess, at this point. We're only a week out officially. I'm talking about taps on the walls. And I use the banners behind yeah. us, but this book which I conceived in my mind uh, the contents largely and kept memorized over the years so my wife would have legacy if I died up there as a prisoner of war and I, so I would tap it through the walls. And guys like John McCain who did the forward, I'd live with John briefly and others right. uh, do that. And we'll get into that as we go on, but yeah, it, it um, reflects, it, and you don't like to go back, so we'll deal lightly with the subject, right? Right. We will. Yep. We will. Um, 
I got your back. In June 66, I got yeah. that's the month and year that your F-4 was shot down. June of 66, June yeah. 1. June 66. You were near the end of your hitch in Southeast Asia. I, I was, and, but I uh, volunteered for a second tour, as yeah. you might have in your notes there. You, you were getting short, and you had a young wife at home, but what did you go and do? Well, after I talked to the young wife at home, <laughs> and we had orders to Bentwaters uh, over in England, yeah. and uh, I said, you know, some people will cringe at this, and others will nod knowingly. Yes. I thought that's where I had to be, and I thought it was important work, and I thought it was fun. And we were doing stuff that was on the edges of the envelope all the time. Sure. sure. John, describe that fateful day, the mission. Uh, we had been talking about, you know, the orders and then, you know, why we why signed up for the other one. A.J. Myers and I was in that, in that particular mission, I was in the back seat, not in the front seat. Went north on a volunteer mission to, to take down a JCS target called Buck Yang. It was a JCS target 1823. Strange how you remember those things. Right. And we got up there and uh, the bridge was down. It dropped earlier in the day by Glenn Nix, uh, 105 driver, uh, and later Glenn Nix, six weeks, two months later, he shot down. Okay. You know, the loss rate was fairly substantial, you yeah. know, kind of one a day kind of thing was not unusual. Wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, in the in that time frame when leading in early 67, it went up and we're along Highway 1 north of Hanoi, uh, well north, and, and hit truck traffic and made a couple passes and on the second pass got shot down by ground fire, tail came off uh, upside down, inverted, or semi-inverted, going through 480,000 feet, dead in the cockpit, no way to get out. And uh, but ejected and 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 got a pop and hit on a furrowed hill that was a, clearly a half mile long, and with with uh, not too far on either side, you know the cars and the trees and stuff, but rolled down this hill bouncing, you know, in a high rate of speed. If I'd gotten a swing, I probably would have been dead. I was I went through Benning. I mean, I mean I know about air tripping and jumping and stuff. And I was a survival instructor, for God's sakes, uh, and I never thought they'd get me if I did go down. But when I roll up in the bottom of the hill, I'm all busted up. I've got a broken back, ribs are lousy, sprained everywhere, bloody. <clears throat> and uh, they were all around, shooting almost immediately. And I got to, crawled into a log. I couldn't walk, so I rolled and crawled into a log, big thing, all decaying. And uh, God, I wouldn't have gone into it ever in the daytime, but, but uh, did, and they, you know, that's what fear will do for you, and then passed out through shock and fear, Yeah. and when I came to, they were gone, and uh, they were gone, they were up that hill, and they were policing up A.J. Myers on the other side, he made it, but he had a badly he, broken leg. He was, he, was, he was alive. Yeah, yeah, okay. he was alive too, so, you know, grace of God stuff, and I figured that I had to... Uh, break all the rules in order to get out. There was no rescue where we were, uh, much too deep. And uh, Highway 1 was just down there about 50 yards. <clears throat> there was occasional truck, tra truck traffic on it. And I thought, well, why don't I go down there and break all the rules and hijack a truck and make them take me to the coast. Uh, and then I'd steal a boat and go south and I'd be back in the Da Nang crap game, you know, in a couple of days. You know. Makes total sense. Well, I thought so at the yeah. time. No, the other option, of course, was, and being serious, was that you'd put up your hands and let them take you. So I didn't consider that to be a, Not a, a plan. Not so I rolled, I rolled no. down and got a staff and went crawling down to the road and got into the, well, I'll make the long story short, there's a little more to it, but the, it, the upshot is I determined I had got to be in the middle of the road for these guys to see me and I got my six gun out and uh, sure enough truck comes along and I make eye contact with the driver and I hijack the truck. Story's in the book uh, again. And what I've managed to do is uh, hijack a truck full of North Vietnamese regular troops. Uh, I know it's kind of funny, you're normally guys just have, it is, it's very funny. Uh, the result wasn't so funny, but, no, but I, no. and I have reviewed that management decision a time or two. Yes. Uh, and for the life of me, I don't know what I would have done differently. Uh, do we know the name and the circumstances of, of who was the first POW. American yeah. captured POW uh, Everett in Al North Vietnam? Everett Alvarez, uh, after the Bay of Tonkin, 
crisis, 1964. Four. Yeah, and Ev and I lived together at a point in time later on, and he right. was next door. He, he uh, taught me Spanish through the wall. After Incredible. how many prisoners do you have to get in? What was it, the uh, the Wallow? Wallow prisoner, prison, the one you call the, ha the, the Hill. Hanoi Hill. Yeah. How many prisoners had to accumulate in there before somebody started figuring out how do we communicate with each other? Uh, uh, probably uh, after the second guy was down. Uh, yeah. But uh, they kept us isolated or semi-isolated, sometimes not within uh, tapping or shouting distance. And if you made contact, then you were, you know, hammered. Right. But Smitty Harris, again, I talk about it in the book, uh, brought in the tap code and and managed to teach people through it. And he taught it the old way, you know, one letter at a time. A is one, B is two. Right. Is and then talk to the tap code. Or, they take a risk, you know, and shout it out. You know, hey, arrange the uh, alphabet five rows, five columns. Okay. K out, you know, tap, you know, tap the row, then tap the column. You know, and then they they hit you. And then they come in and beat the shit out. Yeah, right. Something like that. Yeah. But that's okay. That's what got it off that's the what ground. It, that's what got it off the ground. Yeah. I get it. Because you, you, it's not like in in your survival they they, training they, they said, hey, if you they, ever get they, in they prison, here's a code. They didn't teach that. Yeah. Right. They do now. They, oh, aha. Aha. They do now. There you go. Well, that was how we were able to maintain a chain of command. You know, they considered us war criminals, so we maintained a chain of command. We were able to pass information as to what's happening in terms of, again, those tough years. Relay information that the last guy to be shot down had the latest stuff from, yeah, the, from yeah. sports scores to, hey, how's the war going? We're going to be home by Christmas, you know, kind of thing. Wow. Uh, and that's what we did. In 1969, for example, we went to the moon. It's June 1970, and I'm getting hammered for what they would do is take 20 or 30 guys out and start to work on them, torture them if you want the word, inflict pain, and whoever broke first got to go see a delegation. Oh. So it was kind of a, they shoot horses, don't they, kind of thing where you know, whoever broke first got to do that. Well, I never saw a delegation, not that I was brave or anything, but uh, I had a, I carried a piece of nail up in my gum and I could slip the hell cuffs and do some other things uh, and fun them and they left me alone and there was this desk and I scooted over to the desk. I got out of this stuff and was looking there and I knew they were going to come in and I had to get it back on but the desk was full of letters and I had never had a letter. It's four or five years out and uh, I, did, I don't know if my wife knows I'm alive or not uh, and, and as a matter of fact she didn't for many years but they, they the letters were there and I was looking for them and one of the letters, which the guy I had, did have contact with, was a letter from his wife. So I ripped it open real fast and I'm reading it. The letter uh, saying she was going to divorce him and he got that letter. Oh. I never mentioned who it was. I never uh, I, I tell that story. But as they, then now they hit and I'm still looking through the, you know, there was still 150 letters there and, and there was nothing for me that I could see. And they came in, I was just managing to get this stuff ratcheted down. They're trying to figure out how I got out of that stuff. And I got the nail back up in my mouth. And they're screaming and yelling. They come in, and the last thing they did is they're beating on me, is pull an envelope out of my hands. And the envelope had a stamp on it. It was a man on the moon. June of 70. No, about two weeks later, I got back into circulation. I tapping on the wall. And what I tapped on the wall was, we own the moon. Wow. And that, is and that day there was a big movement, and the camps were all in and around Hanoi. It wasn't just the Hilton, there were satellite camps in Hanoi. Right. And they did a big movement, and that spread to guys who had no news about this. You know, yeah. we didn't have any news. And it was really uplifting. Can I tell the rest of the story? Paul Harvey like? Yeah. It's years later. I'm a White House fellow. I'm sitting at a table like this in the Roosevelt Room, steps from the Oval Office. Across from me is Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt, Apollo 17. And I, much like I'm telling you, I told him with a little more intensity, I said, you, have, you know, you probably saved our life by giving us a morale boost when we really needed a morale boost. Yeah. And, and, and he couldn't believe the story. And he stands up and he comes across. And he, you know, I think Dick Cheney was chairing the meeting. This is before the White House. And he gives me a big hug. He starts crying. I start crying, you know. God. And uh, that afternoon in my office, picture or a photograph and it's Harrison Jack Schmidt on the moon with a flag and an earth rise coming up over his shoulder oh. and he inscribed it with 
glad we could help. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Boy, do I do I have that hanging up in my man cave? You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, I've donated a lot of things to museums and libraries That's and things. That, that one that one great. that one stays home. Your book. Yeah. Your book, Taps on the Walls. Uh, it's ex extraordinary and you know it's it's kind of it's based on your survival and your san and your sanity as well as your imprisoned comrades and and you, and you preserve your sanity through communication absolutely and, and and one other factor we realized that when you run an uncertain race or you're you're having to make time an ally and I use that phraseology in the book uh, that you have to do the best. Our, our goal was to return with honor. We, you know, yes. we, we, we didn't care if we died up there. We wanted to get out so we could walk back into the society uh, and, and not have to feel ashamed of our activities. But you had to keep your mind, your body, your spirits up. And we did that, tapping on the walls one to another. But in my case, I'm a great lover of the liberal arts. I, I think America would be a lot better off if we focused on liberal arts kinds of educations, the scientists and the mathematicians, they'll find their own way. They, they're wired that way. And I don't worry. Sure. We don't need to make every person in America <laughs> sure. an engineer. What we do need to make every person in America is a thoughtful person, one founded in the kinds of thoughts that have spawned progress through the generations, through the millennia. And you get that through the liberal arts. Now, I had a little civilian college before I'd gone to the academy and had been exposed to literature. I, joke as a south side of Chicago guy that I have a classic education from the University of Chicago. But I got it, I got it on a drive-by basis, but what the hell, you know, that's it. <laughs> but I did have an appreciation for the poetic genre and I right. had written this stuff and knew Elizabethan sonnets and other, other things that you could use as models. And I started to create things in my mind to use time. Also, to compete, because the essence of the human condition is to create and to compete, I think. And I wanted the guys to help me mem keep it memorized. I had nothing to write with, so I'm creating all this stuff and memorizing it and, and, and then tapping it through the walls. Later, I got to give it to them face to face when we got into larger groups in the 70, 71 time frame. But I wanted Myrna and my wife to have legacy in case I died up there. How many? How do you ask this question? I mean, during your six years, let's say, how many guys uh, perished in that prison? We don't know totally. We know what Ed Atterbury was tortured to death after an escape attempt. There were other guys who uh, we know died up there. We saw them die. Uh, there's a bunch that didn't make it, that never got into the system, or that may have perished in that Heartbreak Hotel area that initially, in the early years, where they mm -hmm. were so brutal uh, to everybody. And, uh, so you, you don't know. I don't have any specific number, but well, of the people, sure, that, the you... people that we know who made it in the system, they oh. they came out. Or there, or there are others I don't know, but I don't think so. Right, John, your story is extraordinary. I'm glad you decided to to write it and release it. Thank you. And I'm sure a lot of other people out there, once they see this book again, it's Taps on the Walls, written by John Borley. Thank you. It's honorable. It's, it's heroic. Uh, no, I tell you what, it's it's one among many. You know that. I know. But and heroic's a wrong term. Well, heroes. That's an overused term. I I've stood in the shadow of some. I've served with some. Uh, but I think we, I think that's from the inside looking in. I think vet to vet, we don't use that word. We don't use that word. But to those who are sitting out there watching these guys do the dirty work. Medal of Honor. Let me tell you something. You better learn to weren't hero because we got a lot of them and here's one right here, mm -hmm. folks. You're uh, hyperbole. I, but thank you for, thank you for now, your, your your words. I have to ask you one question. In closing, I have sure. to ask you one question. Are we closing? We're, 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 I can have lunch now. You can have lunch yeah. now. Okay. But I got to ask you this. Um, I understand that, you know, even after your release, you went, you stayed with the military, you were in for another... I wanted life. to see if I was any good, if I was any good in fighters, it was you really important to me. stayed in for another, what, 20 years what? after that? After your release, you were in another... No, you? more than that. I'd say I released in 73 and I retired in 96, so I've done the 23 years. No, 23 years. And you were involved with a lot of ultra-technical stuff with, the, you know, Strategic Air Command. I helped plan the PSYOP or the you, nuclear you, war plan. And you, the, you were, you were in on the nuclear strategies, you were at the Pentagon, um, 
Gotta with all on. due, but with all due respect, yeah. Today, when you're out and about, you see a young person texting somebody that's standing less than fifty feet away from them. What does that do to your psyche, knowing that? You used to communicate for almost seven years by tapping on walls. Yeah, well, you know, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it, there's a line in The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder, I believe, and it says, you know, in war, it, it shows John Q. Public coming home from the war. Oh, beat up. He's got his pack and he throws it down and he's sitting at the table at the hut and the family's around and he's just wasted. And they start to ask him about it. And he said, and they said, now we can do this, and now we can do that, now that the war is over. And he said, you know, he said, in war you hope for a better life. And in peace, you just want a comfortable one. And what we have to make as a nation, as individuals, is that, that balance between better and comfortable. And in the end, if we seek too much comfort, we will lose the better. And if we seek too much better or perceive better, we'll probably have a telling effect on comfort. I, uh, I had a great mentor. I've had four. One was a junior ROTC sergeant. Remains so close to me. I haven't talked to him in, uh, since the night I graduated from high school. And he gave me the highest compliment the highest honor I have ever received in my entire life. He told me he wanted me to be his son. How, how do you top that? Wow. wow. You don't top that. <coughs> but John Gardner, citizen of our times, my fourth guy who was a great mentor, said in the end it's pretty simple. And freedom and responsibility, liberty and duty. That's the deal, that if is. you're an American. And if we forget that, then I, I worry that we'll forget the country. And if we forget the country, we'll lose the country. Thanks a lot. John Borling, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Go get them. Keep go. your mock up. Yes, sir. Buy a lot of books. Taps on the wall. Taps on the wall, All right, folks. good. There you go. Rick Seaman for Veterans Network, out.